All you, sir. All right, I'll call this meeting of the Ad Hoc Community Center Committee to order at 7.06 p.m. on October 26, 2023. And um, in light of the circumstances, I, I'm, I'm glad all of you were able to be here. And I know we have a tight schedule to keep. Um, and it's been a, a very difficult, uh, I guess, really pretty much 24, 25 hours for everybody. And, uh, you know, our thoughts go out to all of those people in the Lewiston area that have had quite traumatic difficulties the last uh, day or so, and all of those who's, who are in harm's way and whose loved ones are in harm's way right now trying to find this person who committed these atrocities. So I thought maybe we just have a, a brief moment of silence for all of those folks involved. Thank you. Um, we don't have a, I didn't actually take a peek at the uh, formal agenda for today. I don't know if, if we, if so I got it, I can read it off and kind of keep it in motion for you. I got it printed yeah, here. So uh, attendance and introductions next on the list. Okay. So it's a, it's a zoom meeting. I think we can see everybody's got their name up here. Any no phone numbers? We got uh, a couple of consultants here with us. Um, and I'm adding Jim right now. He's just joining us. Okay. There he is. All uh, right. So we've got uh, we've got six of six of seven active committee members, I think, or something like that. Um, yeah. And then we we have a couple more folks who have joined who are haven't been approved by the uh, council yet. So they'll be uh, official voting members moving forward. Um, did you have minutes or anything you wanted to share with us from the last meeting? Yeah. So we do have. Uh, everybody should have received. Uh, and just so Gwen, thanks for joining us. We'll. Look forward to getting you brought on board on the 8th. And then also just for the record, uh, we do have uh, Scott Karen from Ballard and King, and then we do have Brett and uh, Keith with us from Utah. So uh, we'll turn that part of the presentation over to them. But we do, everybody should have re received uh, via email the October uh, 12th minutes for 2023. And I'll accept a motion to approve those minutes. But I just had one minor um, thing at the bottom of page one under item six. Yep. Um, it says located on a piece of parcel of land. I wasn't sure if that is in was intended to be written it should just that be way. Located on a on a parcel of. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right. You want to move to approve those minutes as as amended? I make a motion to approve them as amended. Is there a second? Second. Now, are non-voting members allowed to make motions or second them? I think we had this discussion last time. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Dennis. Dennis okay. seconded. So we're good. Thank you for the effort, Bill. I appreciate it. Always, you can always tell who's who's run these meetings in the past. They're they're <laughs> eager to jump in and help move things along uh, judiciously. Thank you. Um, all voting members in favor of the minutes, aye or raise your hand. Perfect. That looks unanimous. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have any members of the public for comments here tonight. I think that's probably the next item on the agenda anyway, right? Yeah, just looking at Allison Bristol, I see. As the only other person I've allowed in the meeting, I'm not sure if there's comments there. Okay. Allison, would you like to make a public comment at this time? Yes, I would. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Go ahead. Oh, great. Thanks very much. Um, I just... Uh, I'm very interested in this topic, very interested in the community center. And in listening to a previous meeting, when you're speaking about uh, doing field trips to see other centers, I was surprised that Cape Elizabeth wasn't included in the list. And um, I happened, to, I don't know if everyone's aware of it, but the Cape Elizabeth pool is actually part of Cape Elizabeth Community uh, Services. It's not, it's attached to the high school but it's part of their community services. And they also have a fault, small fitness center there. And um, I happen to swim there three times a week. I also take a, a strength class there, which is terrific. And so I, I just wanted to suggest that you might wanna take over, go over and take a look at it. Their um, pool and fitness center uh, supervisor, Andrew Kemp, 
is a wealth of knowledge and would be somebody really good to talk to. Uh, the other uh, thing I wanted to mention about it, I know you've had conversations about the need to have perhaps more than one pool to accommodate the needs of or different age groups with diff different temperatures. And I would say in the interest of cost efficiencies, I, I would disagree with that. The, the K pool is a competition pool. It's six lanes. I know Andrew wishes he had more lanes, but it's only six. They do everything in it. They keep the temperature uh, optimally at 81 to 82 degrees, but it's still good at uh, 79 to 80, uh, to 80. The Scarborough swim team, I think, uses it. Uh, but they have everything from mommy and me programs for eight-month-olds to three-year-olds, duckling swim lessons. They've got senior swim, lap swim. They have senior water aerobics. And by the way, thank you for calling us active adults. And I appreciate all the conversation about active adults. They do party rentals. They have um, uh, open swims for folks that come in from Portland that have intellectual disabilities. They do parties there. They have inflatables there. I mean, they really... Andrew really maximizes this six lanes to have it fit all needs. And they also have a hot tub there. I'll put in a plug for a steam room and a sauna. But uh, the reason I called is I would just highly recommend that you take a look at CAPE and have a good conversation with Andrew Kemp because, again, he's a wealth of information. I think it would be worth your while. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Appreciate all those comments. And I know Todd was taking notes just like I was. So uh, we really do appreciate that input. Thank you. Um, Todd, what do you have next? I just don't So know. next on the agenda, it's uh, item five, which is we turn the presentation over to uh, Brett and Keith and Scott and on just so we can, I can just uh, verbalize this. We, on this list tonight was A, schedule review, B, what we heard on October 12th, C, review core activity supporting program spaces, ideal program size, staffing and operational impacts, D, geographic and local market review, and then next steps. So that's the that's the core part of our agenda tonight. So okay. Well with that, we turn it over to the UTL folks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Great. Great thanks. thanks. I think we just need to be able to uh, share uh, our screen if you give us those permissions. All right, and while Keith's pulling that up, I just want to acknowledge how difficult it's been the last 25 hours and appreciate the moment of silence and really appreciate everybody being here with us tonight. And I know it is difficult to change your mindset from all of the current events to um, the community center. So again, really appreciate you all being with us. Um, tonight, we really want to focus uh, our discussions around the types of spaces, the types of uses and activities that uh, will happen in the community center. We wanna pick up from our conversation last uh, time on the 12th and so sorry I couldn't make it then, but glad to be with you all tonight. Um, and we're gonna show you an, a bunch of information, kind of look at um, Scarborough uh, activities as a whole and start that conversation, which will continue into our next meeting and then look at spaces in particular um, and try to have some discussion points um, that we can tease out some issues. Really, we want to um, hone in this meeting and the next one on the, the building program so we can start to understand how big of a community center it, are, is going to meet the needs of Scarborough. And we're going to start to layer in, um, in future meetings, operational aspects, cost aspects, uh, financial aspects, so that we try to give you a very full picture of, of the community center. It's not just about the pretty pictures, but it's also about how it works. Um, and so we're gonna uh, be here to kind of guide that conversation tonight. And I'm gonna hand it over to Keith uh, to take us through the next steps. Yep, <clears throat> thank you. So just as uh, I like to put up the, the timeline, uh, you know, again, this is, this is, there's flexibility here. And what, right now we're, we're tracking more or less as we, as we kind of predicted, we talked about um, uh, rethinking the order of the, uh, of the community house, uh, community open house. Uh, we were thinking before uh, the holidays, probably more appropriate for in January and then doing more like an activity charrette, which, you know, some of the discussion tonight, I'm sure will, will be integral to, uh, to developing um, some of the parameters for that. Um, 
And then, uh, as we mentioned, you know, so we 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 kind of really uh, spent some time recapping and resetting last time, and now we're really uh, looking at some of the program uh, features and starting to look at the demographics. Working towards next week, when, uh, as Brett mentioned, uh, we're going to look into some of the, the the real operational cost realities uh, coming out of this and helping to kind of sort some of the features and and activities that and spaces that we that we talked about. Um, tonight in an effort to, to really pare it down and start developing uh, either a, a single set of, of programs or or a couple of groups of programs that we can uh, evaluate um, uh, it, it, you know in their totality so uh, last uh, or two weeks ago was a, a really great discussion thanks everyone for uh, for being so involved uh you know it was uh, I thought we have a really great range of voices um you know people who obviously bring uh, a sports sensibility to the program we have people who are involved in, uh, in active adult uh, and uh, aqua therapy um and different uh, populations. We have people who have uh, young kids and, and medium kids, and we have uh, you know representatives from from the library. Uh, I feel like you know obviously it's tough to get the the entire community, and that will that will come. But it, it, this this it was such a productive conversation that I feel like um, you know we we are getting a, a pretty good uh, depth um, for for these discussions. So I'm really looking forward to continuing this. So. Uh, this is our attempt to to kind of distill what we heard and and kind of set about you know what our what our mandate is um, at a more granular level. So you know I think the big takeaways is um, you know this this community center could be a space for gathering in the community that that feels like you know, some people uh, is lacking currently. There's not a, a big place to to bump into to people uh, apart from you know shout out to the uh aisles of hannaford which you know don't discount that but we <laughs> i think having a a town space serve that function as well would would certainly beneficial and then uh the fact that there there's uh, a dearth of productive programming for teens and uh, and young people you know in the mid to late afternoon especially if they're not involved in sports or between sports seasons um and and that could be a real opportunity. You know, I had the chance to go to the hub on Monday and and talk uh, in depth with with Todd and and just get a little more background info about how uh, community services operate. And it, it, there's not a lot of programming, my understanding, especially during the the year for when the schools are in session um, for for that demographic. Um, and part of it is lack lack of space as opposed to lack of ambition for it. And so um, this this could be a real opportunity to to build that in in the program. Um, there's a, a you know, broad consensus that this should be uh, an open and welcoming hybrid uh, model where, you know, there will be portions of it that may require, uh, um, you know, sing single use uh, payment, which we'll talk about or membership, but then, you know, the, the feeling should be that it's, uh, it, it's a hybrid and much of the spaces are free to enter um, as, a, as a visitor. Uh, and anyone should be, and everyone, and everyone should be welcome. And think of it, you know, more in terms of universal design as opposed to ticking the boxes of ADA access. Um, and we, you know, we really support that as well. Um, something we'll talk about later, you know, strategically located. I think, you know, there's going to be an exercise when we start to look at real sites where we do kind of a, 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 you know, a matrix of the you know, pluses and minuses of different sites. Uh, sizes, you know, location, adjacencies, remediation, all those things that that will come come later. But that obviously is in everyone's mind right now. You know, where is this going to land? Um, and the fact that you know this is, it's an active community, uh, and you know there might have been a, an era where uh, community centers thought of more of just you know a couple of open spaces that people come in and and, and make their own. And uh, you know, community services does a lot of programming, and that brings in a lot of people to the activities. And so thinking, you know, this in terms of a, a suite of programs and then spaces that serve that is kind of what we're has kind of how we're approaching it today. Um, and the the library is doing a lot of uh, the work right now, maybe in terms of that afternoon programming. And actually, we'd love to talk to um, um, uh, Mr. Donovan. Uh, at a later point, maybe uh, uh, late this week or next week, and really uh, get a download uh, from the library team about how they are thinking about their programming, what things belong in the program still uh, in the library still, or what things uh, maybe belong more in the community center. Um, and then the fact that there is a need for uh, aquatics, but not at the um, not in lieu of kind of the recreational needs, which are, you know, seem like they're probably the most important uh, in a lot of ways, at least to many people on the on the committee. Um, and then I thought well, there's an interesting discussion about how 
um, rather than look at the community center as a uh, competition to some of the pretty impressive uh, athletic centers like next gen and Foley's in the area, uh, they could work kind of hand in glove in terms of introducing you know, people to new activities that are sponsored by or taught by Foley's instructors and next gen instructors. And then when you wanted to take that next step or go to the next level, that's something that maybe you uh, go over to those facilities as opposed to staying at the at the community center. I thought that was a, a pretty uh, interesting and, and productive uh, way to think about uh, how the how this center uh, relates to uh, other facilities. And we'll get we'll get to talking about some of those comps uh, next uh, next meeting with uh, Ballard King. And so we, we had an opportunity to kind of build a maybe a master list of uh, really what we saw as, as like a, this is like a survey of uh, what's offered a lot in the area in terms of uh, activities. The bold are activities that are currently offered or were offered during the summer from uh, Scarborough Community Services. Um, and then everything else that's you know not bolded um, are uh, are things that we've seen in kind of a similar uh, similar vein within other community centers and and wise uh, YMCA uh, branches uh, you know across the country, although worth worth remembering that the kind of the mandate of the Y uh, as as uh, Darren said there the um, oh, what do you say the most profitable nonprofit out there they're very good at uh, at program there's no downtime at a Y right they are they are out to uh, serve the community. Uh, but also, you know, make money and, and keep the lights on, which I'm sure is very difficult. And so they don't have a lot of drop-in time, but their mandate's different. So, you know, some of these uh, are things that could be an opportunity for uh, revenue generation because, you know, they are working for <laughs> the Y right now. But uh, so a lot of these we, we've seen, uh, you know, in use and in, in action for uh, other communities. And, you know, we'll we'll circulate this uh, um, this deck afterwards, obviously, with the minutes. Um and people can can look at this, and this might be kind of the basis of uh, some analysis we do later, or when we do the outreach, you know, like draw you know on this to develop some of the activities that we might want to solicit for from uh, from the community members um, in the in our December meeting. Um, uh, and actually, I'm going to turn it over to Scott right now, who is going to do kind of an overview of the service area and uh, and some of the. Um, some of the demographics right now, and that's going to lead into hopefully the discussion about you know what uh, what we see as some of the main spaces and, and uh, adjacencies and, and important questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm still going to let you drive though. If, if oh yeah, that sounds right. good. Yep. Just let me know when. <laughs> all right. So uh, the first thing that that we do when we're uh, you know, working with communities and uh, architects on these types of facilities is we identify the, the area in which people are going to attend and utilize the facility. It's kind of important to know who may be using it uh, as you begin to program it. And so obviously the the primary service area, which as you can see defined on the screen is, is those that are using it at least once a week, uh, if not more, is the primary service area. And in, in this instance, of course, it's, it's Scarborough. Oftentimes, because of the popularity of these types of facilities, we identify a secondary service area, um, and, and that's uh, utilized uh, mainly for special events, maybe some niche programming, um, or if there are not any alternative facilities in those areas as to which people may come to. So they, they choose to come to, to these uh, facilities that are in the primary service area. So one of the things that we have not done yet is identify a secondary service area. And so I, I, I think um, typically what we see is um, either using school district boundaries, which of course the school district there is the same as the city boundary. So, so that's not relevant. We often see a 15 or 20 minute drive time uh, as a secondary service area. So I guess the, the initial point uh, of trying to identify a secondary service area is, first of all, do we want to have one? Um, and then second to that, what uh, what is most likely uh, that, what, what should that look like? So we could add it to the market document. So uh, I'll, if anybody has any ideas or thoughts on that initially. I think it's really going to depend on what you put in the space and i say that sure. um you know like if we have a pool then you've got other communities that have pools around us so maybe they wouldn't be in that secondary market but if we offer high school intramural programs or if we offered um you know different types of 
you know, programs like that or, you know, gym space and things, you might get families and, and communities that would come in that might not have that availability in their town. So I think it really is programmatic as to what what we're able to do um, and then who's using it, if that makes sense. But any, anything in this area, in my opinion, within 15, 20 minutes is an easy, there's plenty of towns that are easy commute from that. It's just a matter of if right. what we provide gives them more or not. Does that make sense? Yep. It, it, it does. It, and absolutely. Alternative providers are, you know, consideration for secondary service areas and, and all those kind of things uh, that, you know, we when we the reason we we look at that is because when we do get in the operational side of things, we know people are going to be coming from outside of Scarborough. Right. So it's how much. And and you're absolutely correct. The, the program will dictate how many people come in. But it also it, it works in reverse, too, is all right. Are we really trying is the project trying to attract those from the outside or is it primarily for uh, the residents of Scarborough? And so I guess that's kind of the, you know, we, we want to get a good, a decent feel. I think we can just use that 15 to 20 minute drive time uh, as a secondary service area uh, that, that would, where I, I feel is appropriate for this project. I think part of it is going to be driven by the financial aspect of it. If it, um, you know, if it's an economic uh, win to increase that, area then that is certainly something that has to be considered but if it's at a cost to the town then we may not want to make it as large sure sure i, I think right. the thing, but I, so i drop it sorry um no go ahead i think the the communities that have you know, a pool or something like that already, South Portland, maybe Cape, um, maybe even Portland to some degree with the other facilities that might be available to people there. It's probably more likely that would be coming from the communities that don't have the amenities that we're going to have in this facility. So the, the, you know, the amenities and the programs, I think would kind of drive that. And it would be probably more, you know, west of Scarborough, I would think. Right. And it also probably would be people who work in Scarborough or closer to Scarborough maybe than even where they live. So I'm not sure if, if that serve that secondary service area would be driven by home address or maybe even work address. Sure. I, I tell you what, what, what we'll do is um, we'll give it a stab. We'll draw a map. Um, and uh, so if you just flip it to the next screen. Um, so this is, you know, when, when I looked at what a 15 minute service area it gets all the way into Portland, you know, if I, if I just drop a dot in the middle of Scarborough, you know, it gets into, uh, you know, Portland. Um, but what I can do is, is take a look at just kind of that 15 to 20 minute service area, draw a map on top of this one to show where it would be. And then you guys can give us a little bit of feedback as to what, um, what those boundaries could look like, if that sounds like a good plan. All right. So uh, when we look at Scarborough, um, population is about 23,000. Um, so these are our key indicators. Uh, when we're looking for a, a high cost recovery. So um, I know one of the items that was listed earlier was that, you know, free usage, uh, which goes uh, uh, 180 degrees away from cost recovery uh, as a primary goal. Uh, but when we do look at facilities that are trying to, to be as efficient and cost recovery is important to them, we look more for a population of greater than 50,000. So um, just want to, to set the stage that, um, you know, financially, it may be a little bit of a challenge just from a pure population standpoint. However, there are other indicators that are, that are, that, uh, are involved. Uh, so one of them is households. Uh, we look at households specifically uh, for uh, those that are with seniors and those with children. Those are the, the primary driver for, for these types of facilities. Um, when we look at the median age group uh, in, in Scarborough, it's a little bit older than the national average, um, which again, uh, is not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that when you look at the programming aspect of it, you do need to make sure that, that the program of the facility is uh, modeled towards uh, to those in individuals to a certain degree. Um, and then also you want to attract the, the younger ones. Uh, median income is on the high side. 
uh, which so it's a pretty affluent community, um, which uh, begs the question, then, would they be willing to pay for some of the, the, the services and programs and uh, uh, that are that are offered there? And again, we'll get into that just a little bit. So next slide. Yeah, I have a question. Is that median household income? Yes. Based yes. on a four person income or do you know? That so it's um it's actually based on the the households there in Scarborough. So um, we use the census data and uh, as read uh, be updated to the 2023 um, uh, uh, update. So uh, that's based on the the average household size there in Scarborough. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. So as I mentioned, households uh, with kids. Um, it's it's lower than the national average, but higher than the state of Maine. Again, that's a you, you would prefer to have it closer to the national average uh, as far as households with children. But again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, when we do take a look at that age distribution, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it, it is a little bit older community. So you do have those age groups in the 55 plus that are higher than the national average. Uh, so again, it's just important to be able to take that into consideration when, when you're looking at the, the potential uh, program of that facility. Next. So in addition to household uh, income, we do take a look at what the expenditures are. Um, and so the, the main, and so the uh, um, cost of living there in Scarborough is higher. 100 is the national average. So as you can see from the, the maroon line, it's uh, up in that, uh, you know, significantly higher than, uh, than the national average. But again, the ha average household income in the U.S. is about 76,000. Uh, so the, um, it's, uh, so the household income in Scarborough is about 50% higher than the national average. And if you see on these household expenditures, uh, the household expenditures are about half, uh, you know, one and a half times uh, the, the national average as well. So it's consistent. That's the, that's the main point. Uh, the the, the uh, graph on the right shows uh, recreational potential index. Again, this is what people are then spending on recreation. And as you can see, they, they spend at a higher rate on recreation than what they do on uh, many other household items. So that's a good indicator that people are interested, not only interested, but willing to spend their uh, discretionary income on recreation. So that's that's a key indicator that we look at look for. So not only is there a higher income, but they're willing to spend it on recreational amenities. I'm sorry to interrupt again. I have another question about that. Where do you get that data? Sure, it's uh, we uh, utilize ESRI, so E S R I. Um, it's it's a, a national firm that uses the census data and, as well as the ACS, which is the American Community Survey. Um, and then it's it's uh, they do projections for 2023 and 2028. So they have the data on the recreational expenditures. Yes, ma'am. OK, thanks. So next slide. Uh, another item that we take a look at is the the. Um, racial and ethnic makeup of a community. Um, one of the reasons why we do this is because uh, the, the participation in, in some of the, uh, some of the uh, races is different than those of the, the general public or of the white uh, participation. So we do need to, to take a look to make sure that the community, uh, that the facility is, is reflective uh, of the community itself. And, and in this case, uh, there is a, a high percentage of, of white uh, within the community and, and lower percentages of some of the others. And uh, these are the ones that are used by the census and that's uh, that's how those are those are identified. On the right hand side um, is is uh, what's called tapestries, which is taking the demographic information to another level. What it does is it not only takes the basic gen demographic information, but it, it looks at consumer habits and spending patterns. And so it, it identifies uh, what they what they are going to be doing with some of their free time and and how their households operate. And so um, the, as you can see here, they have a strong inclination to participate and in interest in entertainment and recreation, uh, as indicated earlier. Can you give a little more color to those tapestry categories? They're interestingly named. 
<laughs> yes, they are. And uh, in the report, uh, we do uh, list all of those out. And so um, I'll go over them real quickly. Let me pull it up uh, for you. So um, the in style, the way that um, that group, which is the, the most prominent there, uh, embraces an urban lifestyle. They're fully connected with digital devices. They support the arts, charities. Uh, most do not have ch children and are met meticulous planners. Um, that's just a quick uh, description. Uh, Workday Drive, um, which is a fluent uh, family-oriented seg uh, oriented segment, hectic lifestyle, chasing children. Outdoor activities and sports are a way of life for them. Again, that's one of those that when we see that, we're, that, that those are usually very good for facilities. Um, and then the, the, the next one there is professional pr uh, pride, which uh, these are typically couples. Um, some do, some do not have children, but they're very well organized. Um, exercise is very important for them, and they are often members at athletic clubs or facilities. So just to kind of give you a brief idea of, uh, as I mentioned, it kind of talks a little bit about the demographics, but also their behaviors and spending patterns. So I would imagine that professional pride and the workday drive, the, those being so high above national averages, that's that bodes pretty well for support. For it does. Facility. It does. And and so when we look um, and, and again, this part of this is all in the, the report, but the in style and the workday drive, those two uh, areas make up 80 percent of the population there. Uh, in Scarborough, and then um, professional pride is about 8%. So um, almost 90% of your population is in those top three categories. So what we do is we take all of that demographic, demographic information, um, and we take a look at what the anticipated uh, participation is for various uh, athletic uh, or sporting activities. So this is based on NSGA data, so the National Sporting Goods uh, Association data. So what we what we do is we take the demographic in information, we take the NSGA uh, data, and we merge it all to be able to come up with what would an anticipated participation rate of various activities are. Um, and not only what the participation rates are, uh, but what their uh, potential may be. And so that's on that right-hand side. And you can, as you can see from all of those activities that we have identified, and there's a total of like 58 different activities. So we just pulled in the primary ones uh, that we feel, felt most appropriate to this project. They're all over 100, meaning that the participation rate uh, there in Scarborough is higher than the national average. As you, the, the two that are under 100, uh, basketball and volleyball, and, you know, it, it, that's kind of curious as to why that may be the case. And, and we're not exactly sure, although what it would indicate to, to me and to us is that there's probably a lack of facilities or access to facilities to be able to participate in those two activities or interest or programs. So that's um, so, again, when we're trying, trying to identify what the program should be, this would say, hey, there may not be as many. It's it's again, takes a little bit more work on our part to determine, all right, is there just not interest or they're not facilities uh, and programs to be able to participate? Um, if there's not facilities, and if there's interest, but not the programs and facilities, then that may be a higher priority to be able to allow those activities to take place. But there, if there's not much interest, then we may not want to, may, we may want to de-emphasize uh, the basketball and volleyball court space uh, within a facility, if that makes sense. I'm right. sorry to interrupt again. I, I'm playing catch up here because this is my first meeting. What does MPI stand for? Uh, Market Potential Index. Okay. Maybe you already said that. I apologize. No, that's okay. It's a good question. <laughs> Could I interrupt also while we're on this slide? Um, Todd, what's your sense of what, what you just explained about those two categories? My, my gut feeling is basketball is definitely an availability issue. And, yep. and volleyball, I, I, don't, I don't know what we have for volleyball court space besides the high school, and that's probably never accessible to the public. Correct. Yeah, and a lot of that, I would, that's where I was going to go, and that's why I unmuted. I would say that this is more, I would err on the side of uh, lack of availability of space. Um, 
even just as far as you know the opportunity we kind of talked about this and i'm repeating for for scott and for gwen as far one of our previous meetings is that you know even the amount of time we get in the gyms we presently have is is off average and so um we do some some co-ed pickup but one night a week for like eight weeks in the winter and so yeah i i think there's room to grow in those especially develop the different levels um of basketball and, and volleyball. And we have a very strong youth volleyball program uh, in town and at the high school. And so, um, you know, volleyball has, has rebounded. And I know, you know, a lot of the peripheral communities, it's a, a strong participation. So I think both of those are just underestimated because of the facilities. I totally agree with that. Volleyball is the fastest growing sport in the state by far. If you look at MPA data, um, the, in terms of number of participants and number of schools adding it as a varsity program. And by the way, our volleyball team is in the state championship. Yeah. Hey, there you go. Next week. And I'll just say to the group, I'll just say, sorry to cut you off, Scott. I'll say to the group, no. I'm only seeing uh, five people participating in the, in the meeting at once on my side panel. So um, don't be afraid to be a little more, um, Pushy on if you if speak so I can try to get you down and then I'll get you up on the screen because um, I'm not seeing hands or I can't see everybody's face or raising a hand. So just so we're all on the same page. Thank you. Can, can I ask one more question about the data? Um, and maybe you're going to cover this later. Is there an analysis of what um, facilities already exist for some of these activities? Um, so we can assess the need and maybe prioritize the things that um, that we need. I mean, if, for instance, I know that there's uh, yoga available on every corner, just about everywhere in Maine, in any town. So, um, yeah. Sure. We, we, we haven't identified alternative providers yet. Um, that's kind of that next step as we look at the, you know, look at the secondary market, but then also the alternative providers. So we haven't quite done that, that part yet. All right. So as, as I mentioned, uh, NSGA uh, participation data, uh, we use uh, a unique participation uh, that, that does take a look at the age, median, household income, region of the country, and national average to, to really synthesize it and bring it down to a, to a level that what we would anticipate that the participation rates uh, would be uh, move, uh, there in Scarborough. So if you go to the next slide, it shows what the the average uh, is, as well as uh, applies that to the population of Scarborough. Again, here's a, a much broader list of indoor activities, um, and you can see what the the potential participation. And again, as as indicated, this doesn't take into con uh, account, um, you know people at, 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 at all, all those facilities. So we, ju we don't know where they're participating. Um, we just know that these are the, the participation levels uh, currently. And uh, again, kind of with the previous one on the potential, then that's where you look at uh, where you could add facilities and programs. So the next one has additional indoor activities. So as you can see, I always like to point out pickleball. Uh, pickleball is much uh, uh, as it gets talked about of late, uh, still has a, a, a participation rate that's that's lower than than five percent, uh, even though it seems like it's much much stronger than that. Swimming is 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 typically in the top five. I think it's third this year as far as overall participation. Very strong uh, as far as participation in swimming. So that's a, a lot of information, <laughs> a lot of data, um, and we wanted to be able to to provide you the, this context. Um, you know, after you, you heard the information about the the stakeholder or the the information from the community meeting and on all that kind of stuff, and then you have the so you have that that part of it, and now you have uh, a little bit of the data and the analytical side of things. Um, and so then as you blend those together, when you start talking about uh, the program spaces, um, you have an idea of, of what may be needed within the community from both a user perspective from themselves, but then also what the data is telling us. Great. I guess, Scott or Keith, I have a, a, 
a, a question in general, and it's maybe more of just a thought. Um, you know, the data the data kind of shows the suspicion that I think we all know how how active folks are in Scarborough. Um, you know, I think it's higher than most in, in whatever activity um, that they're participating in. So I think it's a strong, very active community. Um, one of the things I'd be curious about the data and maybe when we do our activities, charrette or forum, whatever we're going to call it, open house, is that is there some way to gather information about um, how many of these type of activities people are participating out of town? We know most people are going out of town for swim lessons, but like, you know, to Gwen's point, I'm doing yoga out of town. It may be just because it's close to my work and it's convenient or um, yeah, we don't have a pool or basketball or volleyball where, you know, those participation rates for our community may be higher uh, because they're, they're taking those things out of town. And that's, that's revenue time. And again, I view community center activities as, as we talked about last week, uh, two weeks ago as, as kind of tasters and, and they're convenient. They're, they're, they're affordable, convenient trials for people to uh, sometimes for families to do multiple activities at once in the same hour they're at a center. So um, just how do we kind of gather and pinpoint that data to see Hey, who's coming home if we build this, if you will? Sure. So I think there's two there's two ways that we can go about that. Um, one is when you identify what that secondary service area is, and you compare that to the primary service area, and so you can strip off uh, what the, those in that secondary service area are. Uh, their their participation rate. So is it higher or lower than what it is in, in Scarborough? So that's one way. But then also the the other one is by identifying those um, alternative providers to see where they are. Are they inside the community? Or are they outside the community? Um, and how? And and then we can take a handful of those and reach out and find out uh, what some of their partic their actual participation rates are. So uh, that way we're able to 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 look at it uh, from a couple of different ways. Great. Thank you. I have a question for you. Another question about some of your data. Um, on some of the data you had, um, exercise slash walking. Um, and then this last slide you had, um, running jogging. Um, mm -hmm. To the extent that an um, indoor track um, would need to be designed differently for running versus walking, um, do, is there like do, in, in your data where you're referring to walking, is that also inclusive of jogging? And I mean, can you just comment on that? If there's a, a difference in the data in terms of how we should analyze it for a running track? Sure. So the, it, they are different. Uh, so NSGA does an annual survey, and that's where they get their participation uh, data from. And so they ask every, you know, a number of, of through their surveys, if they participate in walking, if they participate in running and, and those kind of things. So they are two separate categories um, as far as participation is concerned. Um, as far as when you are designing a facility, when you have on, on community centers and recreation centers and these types of things, typically the track is, is the same. It's a rubberized surface. Uh, but again, it, based on the participation, it, you may look at uh, the, the width uh, of that surface um, because we know most people like to walk side by side. Um, whereas if you're running, uh, you know, you're typically doing that on your own for the most part. Um, so again, that's that's pretty much the, the main thing that you would look at is what that participate potential participation rate, how many people you, f you feel will be on that track at one time. And the other thing, uh, if you're looking at the, the running, you would want it to be a little bit longer. Um, people don't mind walking walking in circles necessarily, but when you do, um, and then if you ha if it's smaller, those turns are pretty tight for running, and it makes it a, more of a challenge to be able to make those turns uh, as you're running as opposed to walking. Yeah, and my comment to that would be, I because I am a runner and I've run indoors and in, in, um, on tracks, I, I would want it to be circular and not something where you have to turn around and run back the other way. And I think right. that's how um, the... South Portland track is designed. If, I've never run on it, but I think I looked at it once, although I could be wrong. Um, but that would be the criteria I would, I would definitely want for running is that it's a circular track.
Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Scott. And any follow-up questions? I think we have, uh, we're about maybe halfway through our meeting, uh, try to uh, end on time tonight. And we have, uh, hopefully the next segment will, segment will generate a fair amount of discussion and we'll really start to get into some of these spaces. So maybe we'll, we'll start moving on to that. Um, so um, I think we'll maybe a, put this off until we've we've talked about the slide briefly, but I think this is going to come into play much more um, at our next session. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's it exactly. So, yep. OK, great. Um, so we have a series of uh, of, of spaces uh, and trying to identify really uh, the, the activities that we see uh, would be utilizing these spaces. And again, this is, you know, partly obviously based off of some of the work that's been done, but also to try to look at a much more broad uh, basket of, of activities and, and trying to uh, program really all of those. Um, and now is the time to to look, you know, step, step back, e evaluate them, try to identify, you know, the activities that are, you know, maybe essential or core or, or wish list or could be future activities and building in the potential for it. Uh, and so, you know, e each one of these slides, there's, uh, I don't remember how many there are, maybe, maybe 10 or 12, looking at some of the major uh, program areas and some are consolidated together. Um, you could look at the the activities, the kind of space description, which we would have to get into entirely here. Um, but then, you know, the uh, critical adjacencies, which will certainly, when we're talking about programming and, and layout, be pretty important. Um, you know, fixtures and considerations. And then really, you know, the, the portion at the bottom in bold, the questions for discussion. Uh, you know, these questions are really meant to, uh, you know, solicit some some discussion around these just to, to dig into uh, these programs and find out, you know, what, what's what's the essence of uh, of these? Uh, and then in some, you know, much more practically, you know, what, what do we want to accomplish in, in some of these spaces? So, you know, starting at, at really the, the entry of the building, we have a portion on the exterior at, at the end, but, you know, the, the uh, entry uh, lobby and reception. Um, Todd and I had a, a chance to talk a little bit about about staffing and staffing requirements, you know, and how this relates to some of the, you know, quote unquote back of house or, or the office component. But, uh, you know, we saw this as being an opportunity to be a programmable space. Um, and so we're putting putting that out as you know what what are the kind of activities that we would be appropriate uh, within within the space. You can see like you know image on the right. You know maybe a little more generous. You could imagine if there was a a blood drive or uh, or some kind of. Uh, um, holiday activity uh it could be programmed with small booths etc versus something that's much more uh you know that that type of space might happen elsewhere in the building or it's it's really just about uh, a pleasant place to walk walk through and as it relates to that how many people should be accommodated and um and how much seating or permanent seating uh seems appropriate in in this place so what's what's the kind of nature of the space we're talking about for the lobby and the reception Again, feel free to chime in because I can't see everybody. I'm scrolling through the the, the uh, everybody's pictures. So, I like the idea of it being able to be set up for um, activities. My my first inclination, the one on the right hand side, was it's a little bit of wasted space. But once you mention that. Um, what would be nice is that visitors coming in for uh, just kind of one-off things like that don't have to get back into the rest of the building into more organized activities. So I could definitely see a value there if as it being usable space. I think uh, the community, uh, community services offers a fair amount of um you know, field trips, et cetera. So this is also could be a, an opportunity not only to bump it to people, but, you know, potentially a collection place um, where people are kind of queuing up and, and waiting for everyone to arrive before, you know, doing some of these field trips that, that happen throughout the year. Especially if there was furniture that could be, um, like the picture on the upper left looks like stackable chairs and tables, things like that, that could be out there when there aren't activities as gathering places as well. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I like the idea of having it be welcoming and warm. Um, I don't like the the idea of a, you know, like a, if you've ever been up to St. Joe's gym, it's a nice pool and everything like that, but the first thing you see is like a turnstile and a, and a desk with a, 
you know, check-in type person. I don't, I don't like that kind of atmosphere for the community center. I think it should be more inclusive and, and welcoming. Yeah, I think in one of the previous meetings, someone mentioned like it's a spot, and I don't know if this will be in there, but it's a spot. It's like, hey, we need to, we let's have a quick meeting, and you could just like pop in and go inside the lobby and grab a cup of coffee and sit there and have a meeting and not have to like pull out an ID and prove you're a member and any of that stuff. You know, not with wasted space, but you know, without going to a coffee shop, it depends on where it's located, obviously. But if it's right there, you can just, hey, let's meet over at the community center real quick, and we can sit down for a little while and and you know do that or. Um, kind of like you're saying, like picking up kids, parents can kind of huddle in the lobby waiting for kids to come out, hang out there for a little bit and not have to like necessarily go back to wherever the class is or whatever's going on. And if there yeah, were I agree. to be I think coffee, the, the... oh, sorry, if there were to be a cafe or a coffee shop right there would be a great place to put it. Yeah, I like uh, I would I would like to see something, you know, somewhat spacious, but definitely not a waste of space. I think it's going to be a lot of transitional. Uh, it's a big transitional area um, from a lot of activities and and you want to make sure that we're accommodating uh, enough of those, you know, some of those larger groups that are going to be coming in and going out at the same time and are going to stop and talk and, um, you know, uh, kind of clog, they could potentially clog things up um, if it's a little bit too constricted. So I, I, I definitely agree that we're going to want to, uh, we're going to want some space there. Uh, and I, I, I would, I think it would be great to have a, yeah, like a morning meeting or a coffee coffee stop um, for folks. I think that's a really nice and welcoming opportunity to get folks in there that may not even use the space as, you know, recreationally, but you could just get them through the door and maybe introduce them to some things that are happening there. Um, be a little bit more inviting for, yeah, for the rest of the community. If, if anyone's been over to the point before, it's you kind of go through the door and there is a desk there, but you can also just walk to the right and there's a bunch of space to sit and watch your kids if they're playing, but there's also a little coffee space. It's a nice spot to check out if people have ever been over there um, and used it. Like we've, I've, some of the groups I've been to the rented space there at Fields and you can actually, there's that interaction. Like you can check in at the desk if you need to know where you need to go, but you can also just go right and sit down at a table if you want to. It, it'd be interesting to discuss, you know, if there's, um, you know, a concession uh, for you know, for a uh, uh, you know, small business to business incubator to be a coffee shop or a cafe or something. That's that's part of this. You know, where it's really open to the public. You know, uh, the, the, the this whole area could be, um, you know, in some ways serve double duty. It's not only providing a service for those people who are having those morning meetings, but also it could be an opportunity for you know, uh, inexpensive or subsidized uh, leasable area for like a new business, etc. Okay, that, that's great. Um, maybe we'll move on to some of the uh, some spaces as you uh, enter into uh, into the community center itself. I'm sure one will generate a lot of discussion. Um, Todd sent out some really uh, great precedent images, you know, looking at the the size, the number of lanes, uh, the the possible programming, the splash pads, all you know, a really amazing international selection of <laughs> of opportunities for a pool. And I think now now is the time to um, you know, have that have that discussion about you know where uh, where we see the um, you know the the real emphasis and uh, at least in an idealized way without you know maybe putting aside the revenue portion for the moment. Um, you know how 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 big is this? What is what should the emphasis be? Uh, whether or not you know it has a splash deck uh, in, incorporated into the the pool, um, and then some elements like you know visiting families. Uh, cabanas have been a popular way to approach kind of family changing rooms or gender neutral opportunities. And then, you know, whether or not there's uh, a separation between use, uses and, and the amount of spectators that you would anticipate. Is this going to be a, uh, a competition pool that's going to get booked up with, uh, you know, with the full, um, full spectator section? Todd, Todd I, can I ask you, do you have a sense? Because look, I'm not, a, I'm not a pool person, so I, I don't have a sense. Like if, if we get that competition pool and things like, how big is this? Like, obviously, the school program would be part of this if we were to do it. Just like if you had a hockey rink, the school being there. Like, what is the the demand and need that they have versus what would be community things? Because I just have no concept of like how big swim teams are and yeah. what age levels and all that. Yeah, I mean, a minimum competition pool is twenty five yards, six lanes. I mean, I, 
it's just you can't go small in that when you're talking the competition size of the pool depths and dive wells and stuff that's all based on some subjective kind of uses in the backside but six lanes 25 yards is a minimum for a competition pool and again i think for any lap pool that you're you know you're looking for multiple swimmers you know when you're doing a you know a, a, like this is open swim time or lap swim time you could have you know three or four people um lap swimming in the same circular swimming in the same lane and so you know it's the more lanes you have the less you have of that um you know with our swim again a, a six is minimum most of the pools in the state of maine that are you know kind of y level or are, are, i believe are six uh you'll see some eights you don't get into the 10 or 12 or pools with bulkheads until you get into some of the more uh larger communities or universities in the state um and then some of the big, you know, swim teams. I mean, I think, and I'm drawing a blank right now, I, like the Bath Y, um, I believe they're eight lanes with a viewing deck, but they have a very, they have a couple high school teams that swim there and they have uh, a pretty strong youth program. You know, they have their own swim team. And so um, those are some of the activities that I know a lot of our Scarborough residents swim in other communities because we just don't have a USA right. swim program. And so, because most of their schools, right, if I'm not mistaken, the area schools around us all have pools. We're kind of the one that doesn't, correct? South Portland does, Cape does, Portland has use at the Y. I don't know about Saco, but. Yeah, I don't know where Thornton swims. Right. Um, you know, but again, I know that in my previous role, we had different schools that didn't have pools swim with us all the time. Like we had our Wiscasset West team, but then some years we had. Uh, you know, the Booth Bay team, some years we had the Lincoln Academy team, some years, you know, depending on, it was, it's really like having a lease space that you try to bring a complimentary program in. Um, and, you know, depending on the size of your team, uh, the difference on the other side of the pool, when you're talking on that rec, uh, the rec side of things, just a matter of um, revenue potential. Yes, there's a cost to operate, there's a cost to build. Um, it's really the balance of, in my opinion, uh, what activities you want to have at the same time. You know, when you just have a singular pool, like I've been to the Cape pool quite a bit, um, you're not running multiple activities at the same time. So when you're doing swim lessons, you're not doing water aerobics. When you're doing a swim practice for a swim team, there's no free play time. And so that's the opportunity with multiple pools. And again, we'd have to lean on people smarter than me to be able to tell you kind of what an <laughs> operational plan and revenue potential is. but that's the opportunity you create when you have two separate pools um, in, you know, two separate bodies of water um, or multiple bodies of water. Um, and then uh, depending on if they're in a separate place or not. So, so I'll jump in real quick. When we talk about pools, I've, I've operated uh, pools for 25 years uh, in, in, in multiple shapes and sizes. Uh, and then working on the planning side of it, uh, working with, a lot of different communities and so from a, a competitive standpoint so yes six lane 25 yards but there are differences in how that competitive pool or uh is is designed um first of all in in the uh overall depth do you have diving boards or not have diving boards um if you have diving boards you have to have a minimum of 12 foot of of water depth um a lot of some community uh lap pools don't have to, you know they don't have a requirement or need to have that type of depth if you're not going to have diving boards uh, so that's one part of the consideration the other part is if you're planning on hosting meets um, if the facility is just for practice that's one thing but if you're planning on hosting meets then the biggest challenge is then being able to provide enough deck space uh, for uh, the teams themselves and spectators so that's part of the consideration for that um, and then when you get into uh, as far as talking about two pools versus one or however you want to go into that one of the things that we we always like to take into consideration is if you do have a, an accident or an incident, a biological one in, in a pool, if you have two pools, then that does allow for you to not have to kick everybody out of the pool uh, to address that. Um, they could move from one to the other um, if that's something that they feel comfortable with. So because they're typically on two filtration systems. So that's just a little bit of point of con, uh, consideration. The other part that I will mention is um, you, you can have two different um, 
temperatures for those facilities. Lap swimmers uh, like to have those pools between uh, 80 and 82 uh, on recreational side of things, uh, especially in those that are just using it for uh, like water walking uh, or arthritis classes. They typically like to have those water temperatures up to, uh, you know, 84, uh, even warmer if you could. Uh, but uh, I'm sure everybody has seen uh, kids taking swim lessons that, uh, you know, have the little purple lips as they're sitting on the side of a pool uh, waiting for their, their swim lessons. So again, that's part of the, the, the benefit, uh, if you will, of uh, other than what Todd mentioned, he made some great points about having uh, multiple facilities. But uh, again, just wanted to jump in there a little bit on that aspect of it. Um, I was going like to ask about... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, I was going to ask about the, how, is there a way for us to capital, or could you um, provide some uh, clarity on how we, how you can capitalize on the uh, mechanical systems to operate both of those pools? I know that, you know, the outright cost to, to construct two pools is going to be um, pretty substantial, but, you know, in, in the long term, you know, operationally, you know, I think there's, there's probably some um, opportunities to, to utilize um a similar size piece of equipment than, you know, for, for two pools um, as, as opposed to one. And is, you know, is there really, I, I like, I like the idea of uh, being a former ice arena manager of one single sheet. I like the idea of having two, uh, two revenue opportunities at one time, as opposed to just having one single sheet of ice to rent out and, uh, and using a, you know, using a system that can, that can, um, that can keep up with the, you know, with the temperature and the water and the system and all that. So um, if you have any further information on that, that would be wonderful. And then my second question or comment would be, I definitely appreciate the, the note on the size of the deck space for a competition piece. And I think it's gonna be really valuable for us to, um, to have some kind of separator in there between the two that maybe could be removable or like some sort of sliding walls or something where you can kind of cut down on maybe the noise of the competition on one side when you might be having more of a recreational based um, program on the other side, um, something to, to kind of buffer that, um, but then also maybe open it up if there's, you know, if there's an opportunity or a need to, to kind of make the space a little bit more, um, you know, flow, just flow a little bit, so. Sure. So, so uh, just on the two bodies of water, typically they're all they're in the same space. Uh, sometimes they're not, um, as opposed to like an ice rink where you have two sheets and they're almost two separate buildings uh, in some some ways. But uh, typically, because one one is you know typically your recreation side is a little bit smaller, uh, so they are uh, oftentimes. Uh, depending on the facility uh, within that same space. But the, the efficiencies anymore uh, with those are really in the filtration and the heating systems uh, that are associated with them. Operationally too, it, it does allow you for uh, allow you to uh, close one pool um, during certain uh, certain times, you know, as a, you know, you wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't need to open the, the recreation pool, if you will, in the morning, uh, while you're just having lap swimming going on um, or, you know, it could be in the afternoon uh, type thing too. So uh, there's some, some of those operational aspects uh, that, that are part of that consideration. The, there was, um, Todd, you sent something out recently, the glass door in between the outside and the indoor pool was, that was aesthetically pleasing, but would be nice, um, good use, practical use of being able to divide them. Um, and as a swimmer myself, I actually feel like there's a huge difference between an 81 degree pool and an 85 degree pool. So I would lobby for the um, different, the ability to have different temperatures. Yeah, I, I I wholeheartedly agree. I I swam in college, so I I could definitely definitely tell the difference between an eighty degree pool and an eighty four degree pool. Uh, usually even in between eighty and eighty two. So, uh, yes, there's certainly uh, participation rates uh, vary. Uh, th they like the different uh, pool temperatures. Absolutely, for sure. Uh, and that goes to the point I was going to make. Um, I, I'm a swimmer. I don't think the people who are swimming in the lap pool are going to swim in or do anything in the recreational pool. So I don't, I don't see there. And I don't see that being having those two pools as being any advantage to the person who's going to lap swim. Um, I don't know if we have enough data on 
how many people actually would use a recreational pool. Um, I'd like to suggest maybe that we um, do contact Cape Elizabeth and see how much they actually use their pool for recreation. Um, I, when I've been over there and they've got the the um, inflatable up and everything, that's really only used um, a couple hours a week on the weekends. Um, so it would be interesting to see, you know, how much do how much demand do they have for that recreational use and how much they rent their pool out for recreational activities to get some sense of whether um, the, the potential use and or income generated from that second pool will outweigh the cost of um, the construction of it. And there, so there from, is... an op op from an operational aspect, um, recreation pools drive membership um, more so than what lap pools do. Um, and then also programmatically, uh, the ability to teach lessons in a recreation pool. That, and again, it, it, you, you have a much easier time to be able to, to do that. So the revenue generation off a recreation pool is much higher than it is off a lap. But does it outweigh the cost of, of the build out? The, the cost of a recreation pool are, are significantly less than, than a, a, a lap pool just because of the depth of the water. Okay, thank you. There is, and we do have, there is a kids learn to swim size pool in Scarborough at swim time. It's not an adult one, but it's over by, it's at Toddle Inn on Lincoln Ave. I don't know how much they do there. I know when my kids went there, they took swim lessons. It's for little kids for sure. Um, but it is a business that does that in town. And I don't know, I don't know how much like swim lessons is part of what a pool does. I know there's not one for adults. I, I think that pool is far too small, but I do know they have swim time and I know that they're building a new one out at the, in Portland at the dome, they're building that that goldfish swim club or whatever is building one. I think geared towards kids as well. I don't know if it'll impact this. There were some very impressive things in some of the things that, that we sent around for examples with, you know, uh, outside um, slides and all kinds, I mean, there was some really impressive stuff in some of those that looked like, oh, you know, I could see like if we had one of those, my kids would be all over doing that on a weekend or after school or something because it had so much fun kid space. And I've never been to the Cape Pool. I'll have to go check that out, Gwen. But, you know, if it doesn't have those things, I mean, someone had the splash decks and all that. I mean, that's kind of cool. I think people would be attracted to that if you had it. I don't know how that relates to cost, though. I think this conversation is gonna is gonna be. I think we'll learn a lot more about how this is gonna break down as we start to get into the revenue generation component. Um, but this was uh, just for the sake of mo keep moving. We have other <laughs> other parts of the program that I'm sure will be uh, generate equal uh, consideration and spirited discussion. Specifically, the gymnasium and walking track. I think this would be you know an opportunity, and I'm sure Scott, your uh, your input will be welcome in addition to some of the opinions of the of the committee but you know this is the other core part of the program look at at, at how uh, how and uh, the uh, court services specifically break down uh, and and how they should be uh, you know, allocated whether it's a full size court and two cross courts or uh, which may with maybe some supplementary program or whether it's you know uh, two full size courts with more cross courts again you know I'm not sure how much the basketball info is it's helpful in some ways if if it, if there's not the potential to uh, to rent it, this might be you know the um, the catalyst for that. Um, so Keith, I think one of the slides that you showed at the beginning said that this was um, in terms of revenue versus cost. This is a low cost, high revenue item. Is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Sorry. Yeah, there was a right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, so low expense, high revenue. Um, you know, obviously the uh, the staffing, and I'm sure Scott can jump in this. The staffing for you know the the gym space versus like a pool versus you know being able to rent it out uh, for multiple uh, varied activities versus you know pretty singular in, in some senses for pools. I think that's that's correct. So given that and the need that we do have for space, and Todd, I'd love to get your thoughts on that. It does seem like this needs to be a priority. 
Yeah, again, I, uh, I, I touched off the last meeting with, we do have some gymnasiums in town, but again, the availability is, is based on school availability. Uh, and again, we have a lot of, com a lot of uh, citizens that go out of town for gym space that spends tens of thousands of dollars on outdoor rental space. So um, yeah, I, again, personally as a programmer and somebody that deals with all the scheduling and requests, I don't think we can go wrong with more gym space uh, in town, just because it is such a multi-purpose surface, um, as far as just when you talked about all the activities that can happen on that type of surface, um, and as well as, um, you know, the revenue and rental pot potential. The one thing I do like about multiple, and my old facility was just one full court with two cross courts, um, you know, and you, when you try to think about how you break up your programming, or excuse me, your activity schedules kind of in that that after school time uh, when you've got kids coming with memberships and then also trying to fit in some of your youth programs or even to start some of your, uh, you know, aerobics or athletic classes that kind of come into that early 4.30 to 5.30 time frame, you start really fighting for space in a facility when you're talking about your activity schedule. So um, when we get into a little deeper dive there, I'd be curious with Keith and with, with Scott, kind of their feedback on, you know, how do we just not make multi-purpose multi-conflict and then how do you know um i don't want at the end of this to be like oh man we should have had another half court here um and you know in, in consideration obviously financial build and revenue operation are going to be key key parts in that but um uh, there's definitely a lack of gym space and as far yeah, as the walking track is it um is it an efficient use of funds and space to have the walking track above the gymnasium, I, the picture in the upper right has that. I know South Portland has that. Is that something that is um, an efficient and cost-effective approach? Keith or Scott, I'll leave that build question into you guys. I'll start, Keith. Um, I think in terms of the overall cost um, relative to the gym, adding a walking track that's suspended from above is, you know, re a relatively low lift. Um, I think the other component of this, and we're going to get into this in future meetings is, does that also drive an audience to the community center that might not want to use the gym, but will use the walking track and then, you know, have some other knock-on uses to some of the other um, activities that could happen in there. And so it might be, again, one of those kind of low cost, but high impact um, types of programs. I would wonder, Brett, too, if there's like that's an opportunity where your kids are doing something and the parents need something to do. So instead of driving home, they just take a walk. You know what I mean? They, they you know, they, they can always sit in the bleachers and gather. They can sit in the car, but, you know, do something like that. And I would just echo what Todd said. Even if we built a school with double gyms and we gave access to that, there are so many different groups, clubs and programs in town, I think, that could utilize indoor space. Um, that if there's space, groups will use it to the point that Todd will be having to deflect what we can rent out for clubs and what we have to keep open for program for community services, even if all these other gyms were to ever come to fruition. Because there's just, everybody can use indoor space because you have to think about anything you do in Maine, there's like five months a year, any outdoor sport or group can't participate unless they're inside. So I really do think that there's, a, there's an awful lot of opportunity with this. Um, and and it would be what Todd was talking about the, the the conflict of trying to figure out too much use and how do you coordinate that off would be the biggest challenge whether you build two courts three courts or five courts um, there's still I think there's a lot of demand for this space though because we just don't have access to it as a community in the schools. I, I totally agree. One hundred percent agree. I just wanted to touch pipe in. I, I really like the meandering track in the lower left corner. I know we saw several different examples. I think, Todd, maybe the first or second meeting that you had that had that. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, viewing below an activity going on with your with your child or something like that, that there's some merit to that. I mean, maybe it could be a little bit of both. Maybe it could go around the gym and then through the building or something like that. But I, I think having a little bit of a variety other than just a, you know, a sixth of a mile oval or a third of a mile oval or something like that would be much more appealing to a lot of members of the public. And having those little workout spaces along the way to kind of like a circuit trainer kind of thing. I agree. 
Yeah, we're yeah. not there yet. You can see some of these designs with, you know, the windows, how they make you feel like you're part of the outside, where if this was up against the woods and you're, you know, taking that loopy track around the backside of the building and you're just looking at woods as going by or outside activities, it just, it, it, it's, it's a pretty, pretty thoughtful and kind of uh, holistic approach to making the space and to make it feel like you're not working out, but you're actually enjoying your time there. I think those are both great points, and this will come up as we start looking at sites, but the ability to integrate the community center and even the walking track with a bigger network of trails in the town could be a really important consideration when we start thinking about the sites in the coming weeks. Okay. As a you know, a additional part of the programs that we've always uh, been considering is you know we, we've grouped we've grouped these two cardio and and flexible fitness studio. Um, something was pretty neat about that. Some of those uh, track images is you know taking the the fitness uh, and, and cardio free weight component and integrating that maybe more uh, organically into the into the floor, as opposed to finding you know a, a room with all that equipment in it is is actually a pretty novel way to use uh, some of the you know, uh, just natural inefficiencies of trying to program a building. Uh, so that was an interesting uh, approach to it. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to approach it, but, you know, trying to understand, you know, where the where the need is, what the, what the type of need is, whether or not this is, uh, you know, something that's uh, doing double duty as, you know, dance studio and yoga or also maybe integrate into some of the other program spaces or uh, or, or whether... Uh, there's really more of an emphasis on like kind of the strength training and and cardio as a as a por uh, you know proportion of the of the floor plate, um, or and and how much of these are integrated. Um, so there there definitely was a suggestion that um, you know you know yoga in particular might be over -pro programmed in in the town and, and I think we'll see in the uh, in the analysis next time. Um, but it certainly seems like there's opportunities for, you know, uh, dance practice and cheer and, you know, Z Zumba and family dance and some activities that maybe uh, you don't see quite in the, in the same way as uh, that you would see obviously in yoga studio with if the space is flexible enough. I think the flexibility is the key phrase there. I just, I, 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 uh, in, in other communities and gyms I've been to in my life, um, a lot of times those spaces are empty a lot of time and they just need to be able to be programmed and utilized, you know, need to be maximized. I just, I just would hate to see, you know, a mirrored wall with a dance bar or something like that, just sitting there empty quite a bit. It would have to be, it would have to be flexible for a wide variety of programming uses, I think without excluding, you know, making it unappealing to all those different things, right? Yeah, I did mention the same thing to Keith when we chatted on Monday. And, you know, and again, I keep saying, you know, the flex the flexibility of the space, I'd agree, Patrick, is huge. And being able to let a space be seen, I've been in some centers where they've got these rooms tucked behind cement walls with a single door. And you don't, unless you peek in the window, you don't even know that's an aerobics room or a or a fitness center. And so having, you know, kind of an open concept. And again, a lot of places now are doing the big glass garage doors where you can shut it down, hold the class, but then it opens up to something else and it lets that space flex and become bigger. And then it becomes more inviting, um, you know, to like the doors open, I can go in there and stretch and do some slam activities or TRX, but it's closed for a class right now. And so it's really one big space that you can model, you know, make modular and make smaller. And I think that's a, a key for, for us to look at programming for different times of the day. So it doesn't feel like it's empty um, and, and then try to invite more people just by seeing it. But I really appreciate that comment because um, for us, it's, it's not just about programming and having the spreadsheet, but the spaces need to be really appealing and inviting and exciting to the community so that they're gonna wanna use it. And that's gonna be part of our task, I think, throughout this study, and especially as we start bringing more members of the public into this is to get people excited about it through images and, and an imagination about how the space can be used. 
Could a room like that also be used as a, or rented out as a meeting room or would that need to be a separate space? No, I think, I think all that's possible. Um, I think any open space could be used as a meeting space um, or, or especially as a, even as a lease space. We have people all the time, hey, we'd like to talk to you about moving our dance program to you. And again, using a private business contract to, to program some of your stuff, um, is, I think is definitely something that this committee will want to kind of look at when we're talking revenue sources. We don't have to teach and lead everything. We can find partners uh, for some of these spaces. So, Okay. Um Moving on to some of the other uh, types of spaces, um, you, you know, there's a fair amount of uh, uh, of booking that happens in the town for uh, you know small meetings that really are dependent on the town offices or town buildings being open and staffed at the time, uh, and that could be a real opportunity to uh, to have that be you know if if a building staff seven days a week, homeowners uh, associations, uh, community group meetings, etc. But then the, the opportunity, like uh, as Tao was mentioned, for having this be leased, you know, small offices that could maybe do double duty as uh, as leasable for physical therapy or for massage, um, the building and the flexibility with like the FF&E and storage, that these could be spaces that you know maybe a, a collection of of small offices that provide a lot of flexibility um, for for kind of some of these these spaces that like sit below the level of the multi-purpose room or even a seminar room and something more akin to, um, you know, uh, the next level of privacy that you might take a meeting that you had in, in the lobby lobby and bring it up to, you know, one of these small bookable rooms um, provided it's uh, the opportunity. And and then could also maybe do double duty as, uh, as support spaces for uh, community services, um, knowing that they will need a meeting room, but not necessarily booked, you know, all the time. Um, so I think understanding, you know, and maybe this is a little bit of a question for for Todd to get his sensibilities. You know, you know, does this seem like a use, a productive use, and uh, would these be used a lot? Um, and would free to book or rent it out? I think are some of the the models that can be looked at in terms of these types of spaces. I mean, I think I'd lean on some of the opinion of the people in the in the in the committee, and again, if depending on cost to build and revenue. I know we get requests for program all the time and our biggest challenge is just like you said, it's, hey, we don't have staff here till eight o'clock at night. So we can't keep that meeting going at that time frame, or we're not open on Saturdays and Sundays. So I think those two windows, late meetings and weekends are something we've never as a town really dipped our toes into, if you will, because we don't have buildings that are open then. So, um, and I think some of those meeting spaces, I think also have uh, potential revenue benefits where their birthday party rooms or there are other activities that can happen on weekends when families want to rent space. Our biggest thing was people used to help baby showers all the time because they didn't want to bring 20 people and mess up their house. They'd come rent a room for 50 bucks or 100 bucks and let my custodians clean up. I mean, it or like, I don't want 12, 20, you know, 20, 12 year olds running around breaking everything. And we're going there. And so I think there's a lot of rentable space to, in the breath question. I, how is it flexible? Where does it live in the building? And 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 the only thing I'll say for us to consider is, um, you know, what that those tables and chairs and all, when we get into that, how easily they move, store, and flex because that's a huge cost to a building and a huge wear and tear on uh, amenities when you're breaking it up, setting it down, moving it around, crashing it into walls, scuffing walls, you know, breaking trim, and so it's just, you know, again to um, uh, we said it last time again, uh, not to make it purposeless because it's so multi-purpose too. So um, I think we'll have to lean on you guys to see where that sweet spot of value is. Um, but we've never dove into the nights and the weekends really for rental space at all. Um, um, Bill, isn't good. there a similar space at the library? It's restricted though. So no, I think you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the library is booked all the time and would be able to, if it had more space, would be able to uh, book more activities, events, uh, meetings. Uh, it's, it's we, we have the experience to tell you 
that that space is in high demand and we and and so we don't want to short our short uh, ourselves in this particular endeavor of identifying space for a community center uh, because it will get used and, and it will be very much appreciated Todd do you envision that this building would and this may be way premature to ask you this question and maybe unfair but I'll ask it anyway that this would be the headquarters for community services as well, so that you would come out of town hall potentially and be actually in this facility as your permanent office space for the group. Uh, I, I mean, my personal opinion, one hundred percent. We're we're all just you know, but we're all at a town hall right now. We're all at the hub, um, and the lease space we're renting, um, and it's done a couple things um, on on top of freeing up deeded space for town hall. Um, we're all together, so we're we've reduced minimal, uh, minimized, excuse me, uh, travel times where we were using all these little spaces all over town. You know, you take two staff people and they load everything up in their vehicles and drive to the space and unload it. You know, that's wear and tear. And so we've been able to also collaborate and share space. When I met with Keith on on um, Monday to check about kind of staffing, um, I really think with the diversity in my staff, we could we could handle a lot of the activities that come with the community center. We're doing that now, right? People at the front desk, reception, kind of rentals, uh, programming, not, you know, and again, we're at threshold. So as you add more, or expect more, that's different staff. But I think the areas that we'd really need to talk about completely new staffing is when you talk about the facilities maintenance, because we don't have that, uh, as well as the whole aquatics team. That's a whole new endeavor as far as management and, and pool maintenance and just, and the uh, the L word lifeguards is is a challenge across the board, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think that helps reduce the cost of the building um, because we've already have a staff that's kind of operating in this kind of smaller model right now. So it's not like we're building a whole new staff or a whole new building. It's we could probably cover seventy five percent of the staff needed um, in this building with what we have already. Okay, I'm just thinking. So if, if the community services staff. And, and and team was in this facility, you would need to have some type of meeting rooms and conference rooms and stuff like that. So maybe we could kind of, instead of taking it as a purely programmatic space, a flexible program space, that it would be kind of ancillary to what you would need for your team meetings and your you know staff meetings, and maybe just double it. Like, so if you needed two conferences, yep. maybe we put three or four um, just to have the flexibility of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Because right now, for those who don't know, uh, Brandy on my staff does all the scheduling for all the outdoors and then all the town municipal buildings. Um, and so all that runs through when people want to do a rental or book something off, they're doing it through us right now. And so she's the, the gatekeeper as far as space goes. So yeah, I think that, again, in the era of efficiency, you know, again, just like the new public safety building room is they use it for their fire and police training. But then when it's not, those spaces are available and open to the public. So um Again, we just have a greater reach with what service level we do. So I would agree. So, and, and Todd, if I can throw a plug in there for that, um, for you all, like, well, the one thing that is restricted sometimes is the evenings. So, you know, you, the, the Brandy doesn't book for the school anymore. So, like, when we want to have a, a board meeting for Little League or something, you need to be two weeks out to book the school. The public safety building sometimes has space. You can use it all hours if they're available. Um, but I think there's a lot of groups and community programs like that that are looking for just a meeting space. Now, the library is only available at night on nights that it's open um, without making special arrangements. So if you want to have a meeting from seven and like we're having now, seven to nine, eight to ten, there is some restriction on that. And if this building is going to be open for those hours, it would give some flexibility to a lot of community groups that might just need a small space for 10, 15 people. Yep. Good point. On top of rentals, like like just regular community, I think there's a lot of groups like that that could do stuff in nighttime clubs and things like that that could use, you know, chess club at night, things like that that just need a smaller space, but they just, you can't really get them as easily as we think they'd be with all the buildings we have in town because there's not staffing. I've assumed, I've assumed all along that uh, Todd's staff was going to be located at this facility and that we would have to have administrative space for it, Todd, am I in error on in that belief? No, I, I think that's efficiency because presently, right now, we are leasing where we are, and that lease is ending in in um, 
September of 25. And so this was really just a temporary home to kind of uh, do the programming that we've been asked to do, but also kind of work through this progress uh, process. Um, and then it'll go back to council at that time where where we are and what we stand and and then where do we where do we move from here? So um, again, just part of the process and deliberation. So I'll jump in here and just remind everybody that we're we're at uh, eight thirty five now and we're trying to keep these to an hour and a half to two hours. So um, if we can maybe try to get through the last little piece here uh, and be done by nine, I'd really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody else would too. I just want to be respectful of people's time. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Let's we'll keep this moving. Um, another big, you know, kind of key component of of really make this the kind of non uh, uh, non specifically revenue generating the community multi purpose spaces. You know, certainly there's a there's a precedent, you know, across the board of of a, a larger space that might be able to uh, sit, you know, 100 or so, being able to be subdivided into you know seminar spaces and 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 groups and spaces that could be uh, used for smaller uh, classrooms, etc. I guess what would be interesting to hear about is whether what size seems appropriate, but then also, you know, some of the fixed infrastructure that you'd want to see as part of these spaces, you know, there's the opportunity to have, you know, built in um, there, what you're seeing in the bottom left is a, is a, a, a stage that can be um, unfolded from the wall. And so, you know, the opportunity if that's built into one of them and the, the whole area is expanded, it could be much more and more like a theater to a small degree, uh, at least for, uh, for presentations. Um, Versus, and then uh, you know certain fixed infrastructure like plumbing or uh, you know is there you know coffee or beverage uh, for every single you know for let's say it's a, a space that's subdivided into three you know is that something that gets replicated in each one so it could be programmed or is it does only exist in, in a couple of them so uh, under understanding what we'll see as you know some of the opportunities for the uh, a flexible space within within the building which is in our kind of you know, core piece of the of the program presumably. I'll jump in real quick. I I don't think a large space is needed. I mean, we have the Homer uh, Center at, at the high school, which is a beautiful, you know, highly technical um, stage space with, you know, graduated seating and that type of thing and all the AV stuff you could imagine. So I, I just don't see that as being a huge need in the building, but that's just my two cents. I do think the kitchen facility of some sort is important though. Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> The library's plan was to have about 125 to 150 person uh, space uh, with a uh, uh, with, with some kind of space like we see in the lower left that uh, would allow there to be a stage. Is the gymnasium an option for larger gatherings or do, would we have to cover up the floor? Yeah, I, I think it depends on what, it's a great question. I think it depends on what it is in the time of the year. I know my old facility when we we planned a lot of large gatherings in, <laughs> in July because we knew we were, we were finishing the floor in August every year. Um, you know, but if not, we were rolling out floor covers or tile squares or rug squares or, um, you know, again, food and cleanup. Um, I think it just depends on what activities you'd want to host there. Um, my only my only comment is just to be able to have it as flexible as possible. I see in a space like this where we'd hold our, you know, our senior meals where we could have up to 10 tables set up, you know, for people to sit and eat and gather. Um, you know, as far as receptions go, again, rentable space for, for activities. Um, and so, I, again, I'm not sure how, what the stage requirement, if that's a necessity, but uh, a flexible space that you could sit a 100 people that you could divide into three rooms. I mean, when you talk about 30 people in a room or 33 people in a room, you're only talking about uh, four uh, seven foot tables. So that's not, you know, just kind of vision that when you talk about how many people are sitting in a room or even eight people around a bigger table. Um, it's only three of those. So. A hundred people is not as big as you think. Um, so based on the conversation that we just had, though, about the smaller meeting spaces, if we did one that's like the top left, that could be turned into three smaller spaces. Correct. And like you see the doors on the top left-hand position, top right looks like a big room. And then theoretically, those doors slide over and break it up into three smaller rooms. Yeah, like town hall. I mean, that might yeah. be a way to do both. Yeah, absolutely. 
if you can find clever ways to build the storage right there too, where you can easily shuffle the tables in and out, then it could be three community meetings one day and it could be lunch the next day and try to minimize some of that wear and tear. You were talking about Todd about banging up the rooms and, and all that stuff. And we might've solved one of the things you're talking about between the last slide and this slide in kind of the same conventional area. I think you do need to though, if any of these things you're gonna have has to be built in with all the AV capabilities. So you could have like our meeting here with like a drop down screen or something. So you could zoom in, you know, or an owl or whatever you need. So you could do all that in that small space and also that big space. One of the things that, again, it, and everything's a cost. So I, trust me, I understand that I'm not saying this, but uh, for us to consider, it's never cheaper to build and install it behind the walls and look more appropriate than when you build a building versus two years down the road, trying to run conduit and wires and you know tubing and everything else to try to get a space. So um, just we just need to be thoughtful of, of that when we're, we're building, kind of looking at that kind of how everything functions. Uh, this is Jim Weaver. Just a question on uh, when we were back talking about the studio areas for uh, yoga or whatever, uh, is that a possibility for these kinds of spaces? Again, it go, I guess it goes back to the floor and the size and whatever, but uh, will those rooms be uh, available for a 30 or a 40 or whatever size function? Uh, I mean, and Keith and Brett, you guys can chime in. I think, and this is just my two cents. It depends on um, where they're located in the building, you know, what the, what the secondary use is. If you have a, a yoga room that opens up to a fitness center, um, you know, and then is it in the back of the building, you drive and everybody to walk in the back of a, in the back of the building to, to, to for a meeting space. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think any flat space can be used for anything we want. Um, it, it's just a consideration of how far and what we're dragging down there. Um, and then what would be offsetting, you know, meaning or kicking out of that space to hold a meeting in some of these spaces. And yeah, I'll just add to that, Todd, it, it's a really good question. And some of it depends a little bit on the details of how the space might be used a meeting room where everybody is sitting around a table, like as if we were all meeting together right now is one thing. Um, having a presentation where somebody is set up at the front with a, you know, a, a lecture or a, a performance or something like that is entirely different. They have very different acoustic requirements um, and the types of surfaces that you would need to plan. And so the rooms, I think, kind of, uh, you know, on paper might uh, seem flexible, but the, the devil really is in the details in terms of the infrastructure and some of the finishes that go into the, those types of spaces. So they're flexible to a point, um, and then they, they can be too flexible as to be unusable. Keith, why don't we keep going, just kind of yep. keeping an eye on the time here. Thanks. You know, something that uh, looking at programming some of these uh, events that might happen either in the multipurpose room or, or gym, et cetera, is, you know, some kind of uh, prep space, community kitchen, you know, this ranges from, you know, warming kitchen, you know, food prep for events versus something that can be more expanded towards uh, being programmed as part of some that, that that could be offered in terms of, of lessons or, uh, um, or nutrition uh, education, et cetera. Um, you know, they, they've they kind of different expectations terms of AV and display um, and, you know, sight lines, et cetera, between them and space. But, you know, something that could be either, you know, opened up into, uh, you know, maybe it's closed off to the multipurpose room, but then it could be opened up and then it becomes more like a display kitchen or for, for that kind of um, um, more educational uh, aspect. I think the priority needs to be on on making it available for meetings or events rather than education. And um, there would be another one too, if we were to consider a cafe or other business in there. So, but for the overall center, there definitely should be a kitchen, but not necessarily for education. I totally agree with that. I agree also. I think we're talking about, you know, freezer, refrigerator, sinks, uh, microwave, maybe but no hood, no snow stove, no education kitchen. The Fork Food Lab in Portland has got this covered. We don't need to do anything like that here. 
Yeah, I agree. Okay. And then uh, there's the infrastructure requirements for like a art studio or a STEM lab, um, you know, considerably different than uh, storage needs are different than like the multi-purpose room that could be subdivided tend to have, you know, more, uh, you know, kilns or, or uh, portable or installed fume hoods, et cetera. Um, it'd be interesting to hear about how the, where you see the programming for this building versus what's currently being offered in the school, uh, how that's situated and whether or not this seems like uh, some of these potential activities like computer literacy or photo video, video editing or robotics and things like that, if that has a home in this building or if that's something that really is, is programmed that's gonna, that's gonna remain in the school and maybe, you know, uh, the uh, teachers in the schools do it off hours. I think they they might be doing that. A lot of those programs are offered as clubs right now for after school programs. Is this clubs that do some of those things you're talking about? And I don't know if and Todd would know more than I would, but it's not really community service function. A lot of those are, you know, there's a there's a robotic club. It's at the school after school. Um, but I don't think it's been in the community service program. So I don't know if that's something that that we need to do. Um, but I could be wrong. I just Yeah, I don't have any data one way or another or thoughts. I think that we can lead kind of shape some of those things up from the activities that people are looking towards. Uh, most of the stuff is run through the school and we do it. We partner with the school teachers and they use their space to do it uh, in the schools or we, uh, again, most of our stuff like this happens um, uh, during the uh, summertime. I'd be curious with Bill, cause I know that oh, he just, he's off screen now, but I know the library was looking to add some of these spaces. So I'm not sure what kind of data or research they did to select that type of space. So we might be able to get that from the library just to kind of see if there's something we're missing that, I, that we don't know. Todd, do you anticipate the after school programs moving to this community center as well? Um, I, 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 I don't in the sense of um, the, the students walk right from, because transportation I think would be a challenge to get all those kids to a facility. Um, I think it could pose as potentially a, a satellite site if we have the need. I really see after school um, a real real emphasis on that teen programming um, that that doesn't happen um, a, a lot. Um, and uh, um, so I think that would probably be the biggest growth area for us. Um, but you know I would think a lot of our aftercare would just stake just for the sheer convenience we don't have to bust them. Yeah, if we're not going to use it for aftercare programs, I think this would probably be a lower priority just because um, I'm not sure that we really need it. I'd agree. I'd say this, leave this with the school, but it, like Todd said, it might fall in the category of just not on my radar at this time. So I think we could kind of leave it as an option for people to consider, but let's just not make it a high priority at this point. Okay. What about like art and enrichment for you know, um, for adults, et cetera. Um, I know this is, would, would that also be at the schools and after hours or something you're know, not, not necessarily geared towards the school age population? I'm not thinking, I'm, I'm not thinking that it should be built in like to be a specific um, room that kind of, uh, you know, has a narrow focus like that. I think it, you know, perhaps some of the, the multi-use function of some of our other spaces could could handle some of these activities um, if the you know the need arises down the road. Um, as long as we have you know particular uh, mechanical systems in place to handle you know adding some of these features uh, into into those areas or storage to to be able to put some of those items away um, when they're not being you know when they're not being used. But I don't see them as as a as a use that's going to be such a consistent use that it would that it would warrant having its own space, um, it'd be kind of more of a sporadic thing that that could be incorporated into some of those multi-use spaces. I think storage is definitely going to be a key. The more multi-purpose, the more storage space is going to be necessary. Yeah, that was one of the things Keith had asked us on staff space, and everything was storage, 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 storage. We lug stuff around, and people asked to store things. Um, with, with everybody's comments on multi-purpose, and, I, and I, I'm sure Keith and Brett, when we get to that point, can lead us down this road. But um, again, surfaces, both whether they're table surfaces or rug surface or 
for flooring surfaces are a huge importance to me as far as cleanup. Um, we had some poor designs in my previous building where we were doing cooking classes or cupcake decorating or eating over a rug, and then we're scooping off mashed potatoes with a with a you know with a with a with a butter knife trying to get stuff out of the floor. So um, again, when we get into multi-purpose, it's uh, let's think of our surfaces or kids taking a marker on a nice beautiful table that no longer nice or beautiful um, because it doesn't wash off. Mondo. Mondo flooring, go for it. Expensive, (laughs) but does a trick. Okay. In in terms of child watch and and daycare, just try to keep this moving. Um, You know, I know there was some discussion about uh, there's the situation for for daycare and pre pre uh, pre K, what's being offered in Scarborough, it's it's kind of fluid right now, and I'm not sure if anyone knows, um, you know, where where that's heading, especially when when this this center gets built. Uh, but in terms of uh, child watch, seems to be a pretty important um, potential feature for you know enabling some of the other components of of the of the program. Um, and I think you know understanding you know what what the ages are and then the size that's required um, and you know, I think this might play into maybe a little of the discussions we're going to have in terms of uh, the the revenue generation, the size of those programs potentially. So I'm not sure if we have the answers right now, but these are certainly some questions to think around. Um, yeah, and just so we're transparent, Keith had asked me the same question on Monday, and my answer was, you know, I know the state is considering pre-K um, and maybe coming down from the state level. We just don't know. Um, you know, right now we have a pretty one classroom, pretty successful with our kind of rec pre-K, our flubber program, and um, it's gaining more traction. And so I think it's just a consideration to keep on the side. And as we work through this process to see if any of those other variables become um, measurables, you know, that the state is going to say, okay, Scarborough, we're, everybody has to do pre-K now. Um, and they may drive some of the decisions down the road. Right. And I think the Scott, school, how does Clover's how does Clover's fit into that this into this equation for you? Like you're going to need a space for some for that kind of yeah. Of and that, that's a, same thing I said to Keith. I said if if we know within you know as we move through this process that the state is doing pre-K or no, then then we wouldn't offer that program anymore because they would fall under that that subsidized pre-K. The kids would be going to school. Um, if we if the school didn't, and that would be a consideration for this group. Do we want to? continue that? Do we want to offer that space there? Do we want to capitalize on it more? Um, you know, I think that'll answer some of these questions about what the size or the flexibility of some of these child watch spaces. But I would agree, a child watch, I don't know how big it should be, but it's definitely an amenity where I can go drop my child off and go to the, go to a class and not feel like I'm waiting for somebody. So that's a, it's a huge amenity to know it's either a small charge or it's part of a membership. But that's a huge thing for let working parents be able to to enjoy um, the facility. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I'm probably leaning more towards saying that child watch is a definite to me. That's something that kind of needs to be part of that that flexibility for an adult, you know, to bring in and be able to do something. Um, as far as daycare, I don't think. I would, I mean, it's kind of people having such a hard time getting anybody to work in daycares. They're closing like crazy. I, I can't, I just see that being a nightmare to try to staff. Um, but I could be wrong about that. But I, I think child watch for sure. And I'm not so sure about daycare, you know, irrespective of the pre-K decision. Yeah, daycare is a challenge. Then it becomes licensing requirements too. You know, certain things when you say a true daycare. Um, and that's why kind of our plugger program is kind of a hybrid. We, we, we model a lot of the stuff, but we don't. But um, I, I, would, I would agree that child watch is a super important amenity and consideration. And then the other ones, I think we just kind of have to shake out. Yep. Agreed. I agree with everything everybody said. The one thing I would say, this is the attorney in me coming out um, with regard to the age. Um, that's where we may want to, if, if the facility is just open for people who are using the facility, um, we may want to limit the age to um, children three and older or something like that so that we don't take on a lot of liability. Yeah, we usually say they have to be able to go to the bathroom by themselves and kind of set that benchmark where we're not, you know, so I would agree. Right. At least some of my friends out. 
Okay, and then this we had some portions about the exterior spaces. I think that's going to be a little more contingent on the site to see what what's left over or for what the opportunities are. But uh, you know, looking at at you know, we don't have a teen space, but we have you know a you know maybe a board game or or esports or video game uh, space uh, that's you know. Uh, I think people are lamenting the fact that kids these days, you'll spend their whole time on their phones or computers. You know, that's like kind of, that's a big part, I think, of being kids these days. So, you know, I think the big question is, uh, you know, is this serving as a teen center? You know, should there be two spaces for, you know, whether it's something that, ha that has like an AV component versus, you know, tabletop games or foosball or ping pong, et cetera. Um, yeah, so this this seems like this could be the landing spot for uh, some of those folks who are currently, um, uh bothering Bill Donovan over at the library <laughs> in the every afternoon. I think it'll be a lot on location. I mean, if you can walk there for the middle school and high school, it's going to be different than you have to take a bus there. And that would open up a lot more open traffic. Um, it also would open up programming opportunities for Todd for intramural sports or after, you know, from that two to three o'clock where you could do a team based club or something that maybe doesn't get served by the school. If you have some of these spaces, if it's going to be on the other side of town, and the kids don't drive, it's a, it's going to have a different look and feel because you have to either bus or go there specifically and get dropped off by your parents. That's a big difference than walking on your way and get a smoothie in the cafe and hang out with your friends. So I think location will drive. Them. Like You'd need all this if you put it on the campus center and you're going to have smoothies instead of them walking to Hannaford and Beachway or really close to it. If you're in the Downs or someplace farther away, you know, it, it doesn't become as much as need, in my opinion, but I could be wrong. I Is just... it possible to, um, and I know, um, Patrick, we had kind of joked about this the first night, but is there a opportunity to kind of have an activity room in general? And then um, I think it was Karen that was saying, you know, during the day, it actually could be used by um, a different demographic than the after school. But is is that a plausible opportunity to to use one space in that way i'll chime in. i mean i think it comes down to management and expectations um as far as you know if you're talking about a a, a kind of game playroom um you know I, I, not that we can have beer in a place like this but those early 20s now now is a cup of coffee and playing foosball or or, or you know playing cornhole or whatever it's those are those games are getting stretched outside that teenager realm more and more and more. Um, but yeah, I've seen centers and even my building, we had some, some, you know, foosball and ping pong and stuff in one room and the seniors would go in or the active adults would go in there in the day when the kids aren't there, but yeah. then they all knew two o'clock, they didn't want to be any near anywhere near that room. So yeah. it just because it changed over in the sense of really between transition between demographic becomes down to a lot about ownership and if yeah. it's broken or a mess, and that's when conflict happens between yeah. um, the user groups. So it definitely seems like an opportunity if designed the the right way. Again, we come back to storage, so that the active adults can have you know a place for their stuff in there, and um, teens maybe somewhere else that it could be a shared space. And I agree with Dennis. That location is a key point to the the popularity of something like this too. And to, that might also have a pop, it would also have an impact on possibly your day crew as well, you know, but I mean, I think places where you can go play cards and then turn around and it could become board games or, you know, during the day, and then it could become ping pong and something else after school. I mean, those, those would be awesome to be able to, to put those things together and offer people of all ages all day long to go do things. And the library uses uh, casters a lot to be able to move. Uh, objects that are difficult uh, there's no other way but to be able to slide them along to a different space get them out of the way and I don't have enough data but when I talk to a lot of the kids or some parents this whole e-gaming podcasting is a huge huge thing and it's definitely out of my wheelhouse and so I think that we would need to you know, I, I couldn't speak in either direction, but I know it's the kids are always asking for it. They're, you know, it's huge. I know in universities uh, they're building them quicker than you know, it's a draw for student for students to come into university. So um, 
again, I would need a little more education. Um, I'm surprised um, it's not more in the schools, Todd. Honestly, I mean, there's, it's a varsity sport. Some of these games, you know, with MPA now. I mean, it literally is. There's kids that, that, that do that and play these games like after school on a varsity, like high school team now and, and university teams. I, I, have a, I have a friend who lives in New York City and his kid, his kid got a college scholarship for playing video games. <laughs> yeah, I think this He's might be one of those it. programs where um, it might be driven as much as uh, by the audience you want to attract to the community center as um, satisfying a specific need that gets articulated. I think having a, a space like this will get teens here and that might also be wrapped up a little bit with the siting discussion. So maybe this is a a maybe category and as we start to get into the sites uh being able to have transportation to the space uh, to the site will influence whether that stays on or, or doesn't i think it's important to have the space for the active adults regardless of the location yeah and that's a good point too if it's that kind of flex space between teens and, yeah. and active adults yep the question is whether it's flex space or not right. um i did want to just point out it is nine o'clock um, I'm not sure how late people can go. I think we are going to skip <laughs> our outdoor space slides. We'll come back to those at the next meeting. So we're ready to call it a night and just talk about next steps for 30 seconds. Yep. So, you know, Bill, maybe we'll have, uh, we'll either reach out directly or have Todd uh, facilitate, uh, maybe just doing a, a quick, you know, hour discussion just to find out a little more about your programming. Um, and then, you know, we're going to be, you know, winnowing this down and, and you know, regurgitating some of the, the thoughts and developing this you know, program activity matrix with an eye towards uh, looking at a, a activity charrette coming up in, uh, with our community outreach. Uh, and then Valerie King is going to bring uh, some of the alternate uh, local providers in that catchment area that they were discussing uh, and also some uh, some nuts and bolts about the the operational cost realities, which is their kind of pleasant way of, of saying um, really understanding uh, the, the cost versus revenue for some of these spaces that we've been talking about. Thank you. Thank you all for staying late. I'm sorry. This is, there's so much information. There's a, a lot of program in, uh, in the building. Um, I appreciate everyone's attention up, up, you know, for two solid hours. Cool. Thank you. So Patrick, next thing was set next agenda items. And do we want to, is there things that we need to address as a group or do we keep getting the agenda this, like this week, just so everybody knows, this week, um, uh, Keith and Brett gave us the agenda items. I sent them to Patrick, he approves them, and then we put the agenda together. Do we wanna keep staying on that kind of realm, Patrick, and keep getting the work get feeded from from, uh, from from you, Tail? I'm comfortable with that if the rest of the, rest of the committee is. Yes. Yes. Perfect, so I'll, I'll, I'll get with those guys and get the agenda steps out and make sure we're getting them posted the week ahead of time. Um, just the only other things that were on the agenda last week that we, that um, you had asked me to send out a kind of tour date poll that we sent out as a link. Uh, and there was only three respondents out of the group. So if we can all take that poll, um, so then that way I can get a consensus and start reaching out to some of these facilities. Um, right, can so you send that out again, just so it's on the top of everybody? I will send that out first thing in the morning. Yep, I'll resend okay. the link. As, as the only thing on the, on the email, I'll do that. I'll do that. Perfect. Um, so we got November 9th, Thursday, November 9th at 7 p.m. And, and that we'll, one's at the public safety building. At public safety. Okay. So the next three meetings to finish out the, or um, yeah, the next couple of me are at the public safety building. So again, we can, if, if more people want to start showing up from the public, we're always welcome for public input. It uh, will, but they'll be held there. And so I'll add that to the agenda when we get uh, clarification from Keith, Keith and Brett. Okay, I'll move to adjourn. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, everybody. See Thanks, you everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, public safety building. Good night. Thanks. Okay. Take care, everybody.